week is brought to you by Combat Flip Flops. Bad for running and even worse for fighting, Combat Flip Flops are your ticket to the unarmed forces by providing you with the military-inspired quality footwear for men and women. Be sure to enter the code UNITY at checkout to help support the podcast. And in support of women in developing countries, head over to CombatFlipFlops.com and become part of their unarmed forces. Brought to you by Daisy May Hat Co., the custom hat company based in Nashville, Tennessee. They make custom one-of-a-kind hats from wide-brimmed fedoras to cowboy hats. All of their hats are 100% beaver felt, and it's the highest quality hat you can get. They also have the coolest shirts ever. You can use the code BRASS at checkout for 15% off your entire order. Go and check out daisymayhats.com. Embrace the fever. Live the dream. And brought to you by GFDA. Good fucking design advice. The voice in your head and the foot up your ass. GFDA makes prints, drinkware, and apparel for people who want to do their fucking best. Go and use the code UNITY and get 10% off now on anything on their site, including our collaborative product, Fucking Help Somebody. Hello, my name is Matthew Robert Hamilton Leach. Um, it is a double-barreled name that was given to me by an utter pretension from my mother, who decided we were now posh and not working class anymore. But you can call me Matthew Leach. <laughs> oh my God. This is going to be fantastic. You know, there's something about getting the chance to interview individuals who have acting talent and not just say they do, because I've now witnessed two separate commercials pre-show that honestly should be on part of your reels. Uh, Okay, well, in which case, if it needs to be on part of my reel, I'd like to do it now. All right, Uh, I would like to see it. Okay, okay, hang on a second. I'm gonna, I have to get a straight face before like, you, like a dickhead agent. I need to like. Okay, go on then. I'm go ready. On, then, go on. Well, it, actually, if it's like a commercial casting, you have to look bored and be swiping through your phone. Okay, hold on. Let me make it there. Do it. All right. Do you feel better now? Hey. Are you in the, in the zone? Yes, I'm ready. You ready? I'm ready. Did you recently eat some fatty food? Are you bloated from eating a roast? In which case, try deflatine. Deflatine helps with trapped wind. Yes, trapped wind. Nobody likes trapped wind, do they? Well, if you don't like trapped wind, here at the BBC, we recommend Deflatine. And on the box it says, helps with trapped wind. Do you know what trapped wind is? Well, if you take one of these, you'll do a ripping fart and you won't need it anymore. Thank you from your friends at Deflatine. <laughs> you need to get Also helps with anal bleeding. Yeah. Also helps with anal bleeding. Helps oh. with anal bleeding. I don't know if it helps you bleed anally. I don't know. But there you go. Oh my god, that's fantastic! This is what I'm talking uh, the back about. The backstory to that. The backstory to that. For those of you listening, is uh, I went to a supermarket today, and as I was checking out, there's a box of deflatine, which helps <laughs> with trapped wind in my uh, my trolley, which I thought my wife had put in there, but in fact, my two year old has. Um, so now I have a big box of deflatine, as I don't have trapped wind. Oh my gosh, that was so fantastic. I'm so grateful that I got to witness that multiple times because each and every time it got better. So I'm I'm not let down. But thanks, uh, thanks for coming on the show, buddy. <laughs> thanks for having me in this disheveled state, Kelsey. As you know, I've just woken up from a, a long winter nap like an angry bear, but this soothing tea is helping. Well, hey, you're British. Tea will do it. I haven't had coffee yet today. I'm dying. It's fine. So I feel like I've experienced a little bit of what you have, except I just haven't had the soul crushing loss of just continued letdown that your teams provide you. Oh, we're talking about the cricket here? Yeah. Yeah, it's a special type of torture being an English cricket fan. The games last five days for a start and stop for lunch and tea. And it's just five days of continual disappointment and torture at the hands of Australians, who, as you know, like to tell you when your team's doing terrible. And I feel like they have every right. It's the same when they play rugby. Same with New Zealand. They have every right for you to feel fear the second you hear you're playing that team. And then you have every right to cry a little bit when you're standing while they're doing the hacket in front of you. You have every right because they've earned that respect of fear. And yep. as Australians for cricket have as well. Indeed. Yes. They believe earned the right and stolen enough of the South Sea Island players and put them in their own teams, uh, are pretending they're New Zealand to, to give you that fear. They're definitely not a bunch of Tongans and Fijians. And yes, 
Yes. Oh, there's no Fijians on those teams at all. No. <laughs> those are clearly New Zealand names. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness. <laughs> So let's talk about how I met you so people yes. understand where this weird, odd connection has come from. Because frankly, I there's no other way I would know you except for, I guess, as except many for the Except for the support group we both go to for Trap Wind. For Trap Wind, obviously. Don't you know? We do these ads. We do these ads. They pay us a lot of money a month. Uh, we, are, we are we're the faces of Trapped Wind. Yes. We're so the that's faces how I know of Trapped other. Wind. You better we watch usually out. Look like, we usually look like this. <laughs> I know that I have, pe there are people that make memes. So I want you to know that um, I will most likely be sending you multiple memes based around that in the future, just due to the fact that they do that now. So Okay, I, good, good. Yeah, I'd like my yeah. own trap wind meme if I could. That would be well, wonderful. You're going to get it now. So we met because of Neil McDonough. Yes. And that was a weird connection. Number one for me be with him in general and how I met him, that was very odd. But then the opportunity to do the Band of Brothers situation with you guys was pretty ginormous for me considering I had watched Band of Brothers when it first came out or a little later after it came out, I would say, because I wasn't right there right away, but I was probably like, same how I did with Breaking Bad. Everybody was like, you really need to see this. And I'm like, I just don't, I don't know if I have the time. No, I, it's no, I don't have enough time. And then I, and I did sit down and watch it. And I was like, oh God, I should have been missing this my whole life. And, <laughs> and but yeah, it, I, exa exactly. It, it hits so fucking hard and it continues to. And I know, and there's got to be an aspect of this that gets tiresome for you or boring for you. It's like living in that same memory, being stuck in that memory. It's, I don't know if you enjoy that, but this isn't about you right now. This is about how I became to fall in love with this. So you just sit and take it. I will. Okay, good. So Band of Brothers is insane. Um, yes. There has never been since, and I, I don't know that there will be, a mini series done that well. There will be a mini series ever done <laughs> that well again about a group of human beings that you guys got to actually learn from some of you got to meet and learn from these individuals yeah yeah absolutely so that's a wild ride for you too and how you kind of became a part of band of brothers so do you want to talk a little bit about that for you know the people that aren't on your side of the pond that don't understand how you got into band of brothers and what that looked like for you yeah um it I always think of that. There's that scene in *Usual Suspects* where the guy's underneath the car, uh, and then he pulls out, and there's all those feds like looking at him with the guns, and he and he says, uh, "You sure you brought enough guys?" And for me, that was like *Band of Brothers* because I had been in a kids show, like a Nickelodeon kids show, but not Nickelodeon USA kids show, which is huge. It's Nickelodeon UK, which is the most rinky dink organization. Maybe um, them. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's yeah, I mean, it's Canadian like, TV. <laughs> yeah, K Kazakhstan, Nickelodeon, and UK Nickelodeon <laughs> are, are very similar in their budget and their output. So I'd done a bit of that, and then I'd done this film. Um, is this is this what you want me to talk about? How yeah, I, yeah, how I got yeah, okay, yeah, okay. exactly. You're nailing it. Tell me if I get boring. So you're not boring. I did that, and then I did. Um, I decided I didn't want to do another season of this show. I'd done three. So I just like did this actor thing. I'm not going back. And I mm. had nothing, nothing to do. But I decided it was on a whim. I'm not going back. And, and I got a phone call from a casting director. His name was Gary Davey, who said, um, he said, listen, you know, he hated me. He said, listen, um, you know, I still think you're a snotty little shit. Uh, there's a, these are words verbatim, but uh, listen, there's this this thing come up. Uh, it's a friend of mine's making a movie, and and the leads, you know, he's fired the lead, and I think he'd be right for it. And it was a movie called AKA, um, which uh, is this indie film, and I played the director and all this business. And and, and Peter Youngblood Hills, who plays Shifty, is my gay lover in it, which we never told anybody whilst we were filming, by the way. Which was a mistake, and obviously a huge loss to jokes on set. Yeah, I mean, they've made up for it since. Uh, okay, in memes. Good. In memes. Um, oh, but so 
because of that, and because of the fact that the director is, was, and always will be a massive con artist, and that's what the story was. And he, 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 I was mm. never paid for that film. Fantastic. But, yeah, yeah, exactly. So instead, the casting director pulled me in for a little part in Panda Brothers, a part called Dietrich in episode one. Who, then that whole storyline ended up getting cut out. Um, uh, it actually was a really big actor that ended up getting cast in that, but it got cut out. But when I went there and did that, they, they were like, oh, no, can you do this bit instead? And so I ended up auditioning for different things. Um, and they're like, oh, no, we've, we've definitely got the part for you. And I just I was like, I'll play anything. I'll do anything. <laughs> play literally. anything, not even I'll a human. Any, I'll literally anything. play, yeah, a stunt stunt water bottle. I will do anything. <laughs> a piece of webbing. I will play. Uh, but in the end, I did all these auditions, like five in one day. And then I kind of walked out exhausted. And Gary Davy, that was the name of the casting director, followed me. He was like, you know, you did it. You know, you pulled it off. They love you. You're going to be in. And this was, at this point, they were they were only casting like the little bit parts. All the main parts being cast. But the guy that played for Talbot, that's who I played, by the way, um, dropped out that day. He was just like, I don't want to do it. I don't know why. So for the mistake of his life. Yeah, exactly. I got cast as that part. And that was all the other guys, if you speak to the other guys, you end up interviewing the other guys, I'm sure you will, had been cast for months previously and had uh, all this like research and everything. I was literally cast like two days before boot camp. So I didn't know what was involved in at all. And then I went to boot camp and I thought, okay, this this seemed pretty, pretty serious. Wait, you had no idea? No, no, I didn't know Tom Hanks was involved. I didn't know anything, uh, nothing. It, until he oh, showed up that. on boot camp, which famously Craig Keeney, who plays Cobb, says he thought was a tramp because he was doing cast at the time. He had a big beard and big hair. Um, and I was like, okay. And then Spielberg was there and he did a big speech on boot camp. And then Hanks did a speech. And I was like, okay, this is going to be quite big. And then the usual suspects bit was when I got down on the first day of set. When I used to film this kid's show, it was like one guy with a camera like that doing yeah. everything and maybe a sound guy. And there must have been 3,000 people behind the camera. Just spread out, this makeup, costume, props, dialect coaches, just people's peer, wow. PAs, just spread out for miles. And I remember thinking, you should have brought enough guys. Um, and that was my first experience of it. And from then on, I remember, I remember going home thinking, okay, I think this might be quite big. But I've always had a weird thing where I've never been able to, <laughs> I've never been able to see what something's going to be like that I'm in. Do you know what I mean? I just kind of do yeah. what I'm supposed to do. And so it wasn't until it came out that I was like, okay, this is huge. And my dad, who never wanted me to be an actor, he wanted me to be a soldier. My dad was a paratrooper. Um, oh, and, wow. And wasn't, wasn't down with it at all. It wasn't until he, he, he was, he's like, he saw the big banners up in like Times Square. And I'm on literally all the posters. And like me and Shifty and all that, he was just, and then that's it. Now, now he's a complete convert now. Do you know what I mean? Now he wears a cravat yeah. and thinks he's a theatre director now. Do you know what I mean? So, oh well, hey. But that's that's how I got involved. It's so crazy to me to think about the amount of uh, dots that had to connect in order for you to get the part and be in, and then not be cut out and get that role. It's the when you really look back and you try to connect those things, it's insane when you see. You know, you had to be at the right place at the right time. And it's funny to me when you when you say the things that you do in the different accents, because frankly, <clears throat> I don't know that I could handle being an actor in the UK. There's something about that accent that just screams, I've been disappointed of like about you since the day you were born. Am I wrong? What like I'm I'm a forlorn character, is that what you're saying? Like I've just No, like you're around. No, your accent is normal to me. But yes. when you do, uh, was it Gary you said? Yeah. His accent, that accent, wherever that dialect is from, because I'm not sure exactly, it just it reminds me of the crown. And all I hear Pretentious Town. Is, it's from Pretentious yes, Town. Yeah. That's, yeah. So that just screams, every time I hear that tone, I just hear, I've been just like, they could be saying words, but I'm hearing, yes. I've been disappointed since the day you've been born. Right. That's, yes. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 yeah. It is. Yeah. People are continually disappointed in you as an actor over here. I think uh, casting and 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 directing people just sort of 
oh god you know if they could cast if they could just draw a picture on their own hand and do it themselves they'd rather that than cast you right i'm just going to play myself you're going this is going to be this this time from here right okay um yeah. What, is, what is why is it so different is do, is there an answer to this why is the you know, united states television it seemed as to be this huge place for tv but yet there's plenty of actors from all over the world that make fantastic fantastic films and tv series but yet the the u.s is still seems to be the prominent place because if you think about dollars and revenue the United States does not bring in the most dollars in revenue for film, period. It doesn't. China brings more in in one weekend than most films bring in the United States at all. Right. So I, why? I, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's – I really don't know the answer to that question. I think they just throw more behind it. Um, mm. They throw more behind it, and it's, it's an American art form. <laughs> Um, right. Yeah, it is the American art form, TV, film, and, and they just keep making it better and better. All these Netflix shows and all this stuff are just fantastic. Mm-hmm. In England, it, it's sort of, it's still not 100%, but it's still considered a little bit beneath you to do TV. You still should be doing theatre. In my early auditions because I came through out of drama school and I just did a bunch of television like this like kids show and stuff and I would go to a theater audition and they would add a little diphthong into the word theater so it sounds like theater that's how you properly pronounce it if you want to be a total wanker um oh. and look at my CV and go oh no theater there um and I'm like no so I don't want to be paid a hundred dollars a week for working 500 hours thanks very much yeah really um, but the, yeah the attitudes in America is, I've gone off on a slight tangent here, but I actually have written a question for a show I'm going to do about this. What's the difference between American and English actors? And I remember I hadn't really worked with American actors before. They are so supportive and so positive. And it seems weird. It's like you're in a, for me, it was like being in a cult. It's (laughs) It's like, you know, very sort of selfish and competitive people. I remember James Maddio, who, who plays Picante in the show, coming up to me and going, dude, man, you got great skin. And I thought, are you, dude, man. Are you hitting on me? I don't, is, is that, but he just meant it. Do you know what I mean? You've got great skin. You've got really nice yeah. skin. And everything I would do, like on camera, he'd be watching behind, going, oh, my house, money, my house, awesome, that money. And I think, okay, you're, you're, why are you so supportive? Right. You didn't have that then. At all? No, and, well, no, we don't have that. No, it tends to be quite competitive. Well, is it competitive because they're all trying to get American jobs, or is it competitive because there just isn't that much TV over there? Like, I think uh, so. Serious, yeah. I, I think just, this, I think it's I a just, bit. Of, it's a bit of both. It's a bit of both. I think there's also there tends to be a different type of person that becomes an actor in England as well. Um. Whereas in America, I think you just come through a different system. Like, they don't have drama schools in America, particularly, but we have them. And they're very competitive to get in. And then it's sort of competitive when you're there. And then mm. you leave and you're sort of, you know, smashed into your head that you've really got to kick, bite, elbow, a scream in the face of your opponent to get the job. Whereas in America, there's so much work. And it's just like they don't count other people's money. Do you know what I mean? It's like, oh, you're doing really well. Good for you. Do you know what I mean? Right. Oh, that means I can do well rather than, oh, you're doing really well. That means, you know, I'm not going to get a job. You suck. I hate you. And yeah, there's all lights out when you're on stage. There's genuine like support behind it rather than just saying it for face value. Yeah. And, but I think that's true with Americans all up. I mean, I've, I've run a business in America and I found that there as well. I found Americans to be incredibly supportive. Uh, it's yeah. just not the English mentality to be supportive. I don't know why. How's that worked out for you all the way over there? You guys really uh, loving that <laughs> attitude, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm stuck back in England. Girl, bloody wait to escape again. <laughs> it's okay. I'm doing the same with Canada. We're all trying to escape um, the <laughs> communist country of China, Canada. So it's whatever it is, man. I'm right there with you. I'm curious because you just, you, you said that your dad was a paratrooper. So yes. let, let me, let me hit this. How do you yep. 
go from having a dad who was a paratrooper who served, did he serve? Uh, Falklands, Ireland, the first Iraq war, but uh, for Falklands and the first Iraq war, he was a medic by then. He left the parachute regiment when I was young. So yeah, he's, he's a veteran of quite a few campaigns. Okay, so he's a highly decorated individual. How, yeah, he's a colonel how do, as well. Oh, okay. So, I mean, just reach for the stars there. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> Don't so you're, just you're, you're gleaning, you're, you're, you're getting to the point of how much of a disappointment I am to him now, aren't you? No, <laughs> I'm not saying you're a disappointment. I don't think, listen, I think Band of Brothers is something that is, and your work that you do, and film in, in the arts in general, they are invaluable to society they right. are the 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 type of film is often based in my opinion around you know situations that have happened or they're based on in the world and those are time capsules those are where humanity was at and those are portrayed by individuals who frankly it's incredibly difficult to do that job and i don't care what anybody says but they're, they're just acting like you have never been on a set and been told to do anything in front of a camera and a lot of other people, it's really awkward. So don't know. So I do think that, that there is such use in film and television in humanity because of what it does. And so, no, I don't think you're a disappointment. I think it's a different thing though. So it's just different. What your dad did, what you do is, is different. Um, for, for you growing up, having a dad that was in the military, what was that like for you? Or is that just normal? Uh, normal, I guess. Like, uh, like anybody who has, you know, whose dad does something, you just like that's that's what my dad does. Uh, it meant a lot of moving around. Um, mm. Where I don't know whether they do the same in the American Army, um, but they, you know, you you posted somewhere new every two and a half or three years, which meant I was often like, yeah, I went to Germany and then all around Germany and then back in the different parts of the UK. And, and so I was always at different schools and then I had to go to a boarding school. Um, so it sets you up to be an actor really, because you're always, always doing something different. You're always moving. You're always kind of got itchy feet. You don't really want to settle anywhere. You're always going to want to do something new. So it's, it's actually pretty good training. Um, it was, uh, he was away quite a bit. Uh, he was away for the entire year of the bit of the Falklands. He was away for the whole of the Gulf campaign. So yeah, it's, it, that, that element was, was, was a bit, was tricky to deal with. You know, I went to a, a, like a military boarding school as well. So Whoa, what is that? It, 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 it was, um, people in the services basically sent their kids to this boarding school, which is actually not far from where I live now. Um, and so when the Gulf War kicked off, a lot of kids' parents were there. So that was a very strange atmosphere. You know, we had like, like fighter pilots, sons there and stuff that were like, shit, yesterday two tornadoes got shot down, you know, the next one could be my dad or... Um, that was that was kind of strange. Um, on the plus side, I did get sent a lot of swag because they kept doing <laughs> loads of dealings, especially with the American soldiers uh, for the um, ration packs. You know the British ration packs. Yeah, yeah, uh, I've had them. A premium compared to the American MREs, which are disgusting. So my yeah. dad could trade anything he wanted with all these ration packs. So that was cool. Um, but it all it all just was always kind of a bit normal to me to watch my dad go off to work in his army gear. That bit I've always found strange. Why why soldiers get dressed him in camouflage gear to go into like an office situation? <laughs> I, you know, I don't understand that either because there's yeah. so many times I would be in Ottawa at the Capitol and yeah. it's where that's our capital. So there's tons of military there, all the colonels, everyone's there. And they're all wearing these super dress uniforms you normally only see on Remembrance Day or they're head to toe and we're wearing our green cab pad and we're marching around in boots. And I don't understand it. It feel, it felt very like um, when you wore your uniform outside the base, it felt, felt very, what's a good example of that? 
almost like Cuban or like from like Nicaragua, like a bunch of military walking in the streets. And like, I right. can imagine all the civilians are like, what's happening? Yeah. Like, why is are we being occupied? Is but that's, but that's what it feels like when you live yeah. somewhere close and you see all these uniforms and they're just going to normal offices. I'm like, yeah. I feel like things are happening and I don't like seeing uniforms on the streets. Right. Yeah. I, cause sometimes my dad would, he would, uh, he would take me to work with him and he'd be in all this, you know, combat gear and we go through the gate and then blows up and then he'd, and then, go, and then he'd sit in an office and make phone calls. And I'd think, why do you need to be camouflaged? I don't, <laughs> you're not camouflaged in this office. I don't, I don't no, know. it doesn't work that bit. way. It doesn't work that way. No, you need some like, urban, like dress like a desk um, or something. <laughs> that bit was all a bit strange as well. <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny just dress like a desk all officers for in duty are are issued yeah. uniforms that are desks yeah or like you know a whole row of books that you can stand like this next to the next to a bookshelf in case someone bursts in because he's really standing out in that camouflage stuff as you can tell i've always had a surreal outlook on it <laughs> i love i love the thought process and, and I, I just really love the thought process it was really fantastic um because that's a different thing growing up with people in the military and the oh the emotional toll that takes on kids when mm -hmm. their parents are deploying on a regular basis and if you had a whole if you had a whole unit and a whole group of family regiment and all their kids were there was your mum around during? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's not like, that's one thing that you guys do too that I don't understand. You do boarding schools where you just send your kids. Yeah. And you're like, that... see ya, never. I know it's weird because I mean, now I have kids and it's like, I can't, I can't Can you imagine? imagine my kid away. I know. And I would go away. I went away age 10 and I'm five foot seven now and when i was 10 i looked about six and i was about three foot two and we lived in germany i was put on a flight in a uniform to another country and i stayed at school for three months at a time we stayed at school for three months at a time uh yeah who, exactly. That's, who, who uh, pitched this as a good idea <laughs> oh no, oswald mosley i don't know somebody came up with it 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 was. It's something that the the posh people do. You Downton Abbey people send their kids away to boarding school, and oh, so no. there's something slightly um, aspirational about it. I think being able to send your children away to boarding being school, being able to afford them, being, being able, able to afford, to afford them. it. Yeah, and so as my father grew it in ranks, the boarding schools that we all got sent to got slightly better. I went to. I always say it was a little bit like a Borstal uh, boarding <laughs> school. My sister went to a nice one. My sister went to a really nice boarding school. Um, uh, it, it is it is a very strange. I went back recently, and it's completely different. Like it was all boys as well. So um, now it's like you know it's co-ed, and the teachers are really like cool. And you know when I was there, it was it, it was it was like being in prison, really. <laughs> well, that's what it sounds. I'm so sorry to like. Pull apart your childhood right now, but I'm I'm so fascinated by this. You you having this, having to go live somewhere else, and at ten years old, my son's five. The idea of him, me being like, you're moving to another country without me. I mean, he's independent yeah. enough; he would do it. He would be like, I can do right. that. But right. I can't imagine not seeing my son every single day. That just blows my mind. I mean if you have siblings and they go to separate, there's different genders and they go to separate boarding schools, are they really siblings? What, what is happening? I don't understand the benefit. Uh, the, the only benefit, the only benefit is that you don't have to move your kids to a different school every couple of years. That's it. So just adversity is too hard and we don't want to give them adversity that way. We would rather, we would rather we, just yeah, let them. We would rather have sort of like organized posted neglect. So you can go bugger off for three months and I'll ride horses. Um, not that that's a dig at my mother. Uh, but that's what <laughs> not at thought. all. There was and no emotion there at all. <laughs> not at all. I don't know. They just, uh, yeah. I just, uh, and I, I don't know whether it was the 1980s. I was telling this on a, um, telling the stories, you know, <laughs> It, I went just after my 10th birthday, which my parents forgot. My parents forgot my 10th this birthday. Is, this so is getting just better. Didn't care. I'm thinking, 
I was a bit like a raccoon, you know, they knew I was around, but they weren't sure where. And then finally they poked me with a stick, put me in a box and sent me off. <laughs> What's that noise? Is that a, is that a child? Are we a child? Put me in a box and sent me off. And it has, it's weird. Like I'm quite independent. So I, I have three other siblings. I'm quite independent. So it did actually all laugh and aside, it did kind of suit me. Uh, to be away and to be able to do my own thing, but it didn't suit my other siblings, <laughs> all of whom oh. are complete disasters now. Uh, getting better, but pretty much complete disasters. Uh, I don't think it set them up particularly well in life. Um, okay. So yeah, I don't. But there's 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 no benefit I can really think of. You know, I just uh, I didn't realize it was so prevalent until I went to China to visit some factories and stuff um, last year and the year and then I think the year before that I went um, <clears throat> and one of the owners was taking us to dinner and she picked up her son at seven o'clock at night and I was like it's seven o'clock on a Wednesday and she's like yeah they my youngest son goes from seven in the morning till seven at night yeah. and he comes home and does homework and he goes to bed and then he does it again. And my other son just lives there. Oh, right. I'm okay, like, that's nice. So your kid, like, we see them twice a year. I'm like, oh, but they're babies. They're, they're, they're babies. And they're like, yeah, this is what we do. And I was like, oh. oh right. Okay. The, so The other thing, I mean, it, it, I mean, they've, yeah, like I said, they've integrated my old school now. God knows what it's like now. <laughs> It must just be like one long prom night. Um, oh. But I can spot someone who went to a boarding school, particularly an all-boys no. boarding school, like a public school, from a hundred miles away. No, if I could see him, you... I, yeah. If, if if there was a if we were doing a Zoom now, I'd think that guy went to a boys boarding school. I can tell that guy went to a public school. That guy went How to boarding school. How can you tell? Is tell. it in their eyes? Is it the loss like a, in like their a eyes? Dog, yeah. Um, uh, like a lost dog. No, there's something about the way they talk. Well, there's a there's a there's a there's a there's an accent as well. There's a public school accent, which does give it away. But because because you're a woman, am I allowed to say that? Am I or I just say a person I know? I'm not quite sure. Am I allowed to say that? You're yeah, a we're woman? gonna. Yeah, I'm. I'm pretty. I'm pretty steadfast in the fact that I'm a woman, and that's there's two. That I'm a woman, and then there's generally men, and then that's how people feel. But I'm a woman, so I'm more okay, than good, comfortable. Good, you good. Can call I me a woman. Very careful. I can just call you a human that I know. Otherwise, uh, please don't ever do that to me. <laughs> okay, good. Um, there's a way that they interact with women that is just awkward, awkward to a just a skin crawling degree. <laughs> they have no idea how. To talk to a woman at all. So how'd you get married then? Uh, how'd she get so lucky? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good question, actually. Uh, well, I got I I got better at it uh, soon after. It helped that I then went to a drama school that was mostly women. Um, oh, there you go. Uh, <clears throat> so I got better at it, but there's just a kind of clunky, awkward ness and an assumed behavior that you you know you want to be spoken to like you wear a big billowy dress and you know i need to you know good yes <laughs> good day miss webbington has come to my attention the subject of your marriage you know they just oh my goodness it's just a, and it's, it's either a clunky awkwardness or it's just just a kind of slightly pervy weirdness do you know what i mean you, like, please don't please don't say that to her. please don't say that to her do you know what i mean don't, don't, don't say that that's weird that's weird um and so i can spot it a mile away it's not it's probably much better now but it wasn't a good learning ground the english public school system was set up to breed men to run the empire and uh, it hasn't got much better in oh, whom no? it turns out, if you come over to England and you think, what is up with that colossal wanker? He went to a public school. I served with the British. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't need yeah. to say more than that. Right, exactly. Yeah, they were great. Yeah, they were great. But some, I 
far as I could throw them. Just couldn't, well, yeah, exactly. Couldn't yeah. care less. Yeah. Just yeah. mind blowing different ways of, of, of schooling and education and the British, because the military is compiled with Fijians and the South Africans and the English and Scottish and Irish. And you're also freaking different. There's always bound to be some type of um, disagreement or something said that's just where the fuck did that come from? Nobody needed that at all. That wasn't a value <laughs> add at all. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's the boarding school. So now I've learned and now I understand, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. The, 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 there's a great tranche of people that have been imprisoned since they were very small. Um, yeah. Uh, in a weird sort of um, Scientologist style right building and they you drew the comparison the same i did i did i did you and now I'm, I'm assuming that i'm going to get squirreled outside my window by weird scientologists with their you, cameras you uh firing things at my house how dare you how dare you i used to i used to live not far from the church of scientology in la um where oh. you could on the street be a word that I'm pretty sure they made up. It's called proselytized, um, which I think has five too many eyes in it um, for it to be a real word. But yes, you can you can you can come in and and be proselytized, which is basically you know indoctrinated. Indoctrinated is the proper yeah. word. Yeah, yeah. By these, that's the by accurate these. word. That's the accurate. <laughs> That's pronounced indoctrinated. Um, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> and now, oh. now a word from our sponsor, Deflity. Are you a Scientologist? Or are you a Scientologist? Yeah. <laughs> also, Gil <kill> Scientology. <laughs> oh, man, I'm going to... Oh, I'm going to get beaten up in the street. I can't Sorry. wait. I yeah, can't one. wait. No, this yeah. is the best. I am so happy right now. This is fantastic. <laughs> there's so many things. So you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna bob all around here because there's a lot of different things I want to talk to you about. But um yeah. so we know that your you know your judgment in cricket and sports is just not great. Nope. Okay, great. We know that you um you had a dad that was a genuine hero to the nation yes and um we know you went to full-time boarding school and so now everything's starting to make like so much sense right right yeah so you get this part on band of brothers yes do any of you really understand the weight of what you're doing uh well speaking of indoctrination on boot camp mm. Uh, we would do all the boot campy stuff during the day. And then on a night, we would have um, uh, what the Hitler youth would, you know, when, when, they, when they were taught, not, you know, Nazism on a night, you know, the, the scripture of it. We would have Dale Dye telling us exactly why we were doing what we were doing and the importance of it. And it started out with a bunch of kind of like, you know, guys who thought they were it. And then it started to slowly go in. And you were starting to think, oh, right, okay, okay, okay. And then, like, the it got to a point where it was like, oh, 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 okay. Um, but the when it hit home is Tom Hanks came down to boot camp and he'd shaved and everything now, so he wasn't, he wasn't this big beardy guy from Castaway. And he got up and he did a speech on the importance of what we were doing while we had to stick it way he, he, he predicted that a lot of it for all of us would just be you'd be 400 miles from the nearest camera I was shivering in a ditch but you know you have to stick at it we're doing it really it's really important he gave this speech that nobody recorded even though there were cameras oh up. that's right yes that's yeah. right we talked about yeah. that at the reunion yeah um he gave this speech that you afterwards you could hear a pin drop and then like 60 guys got up and started cheering. And it was from that moment on, it was like, okay, we get it. Um, and I don't think there was anybody who didn't understand the importance of it. Uh, especially you were around people like Frank John Hughes, who played Garnier. I mean, that guy, <laughs> that guy's, I think he's insane. I'm not sure, but he was <laughs> so, so deep into it. I still think now he's in about 
62. So it doesn't quite a lot of what there. he does. Yeah, a lot of what he does yeah. Yeah. is that similar, um, not similar character, but it's got that roughness, that depth yeah. about him. And I feel like that's probably just stuck with him. Yeah, it did. It did stick with him for a long time. He's actually just just right now playing Frank Sinatra in an HBO show, which should be fantastic. Um, so if you get him on, he's probably likely to sing to you or have you whacked listen, by the mafia. Yeah. Uh, listen, uh, send him my way. I don't um, have his phone number. I'm not as cool as you. I also don't have his easy, easy will of the wisp. I don't have his phone number, but I do have his email. So I could email him for you. Um, but yes, to answer your question, once we started rolling, I don't know whether at first the whole episode one was reshot, and I don't know whether it was because it wasn't impactful or it was a bit confused. There are two, there are alternate versions of episode one. Um, so I don't know whether we hadn't, we weren't quite getting it. But by the time it started rolling and by the time the explosion started happening, yeah, people people were getting it. They were like, "All right, okay, this is this is full on. This is serious. This is this is a once in a lifetime thing. This is going to be fantastic." And you have to remember that um, Private Ryan had only just come out. Really, um, mm-hmm. it had only been out a year or so. And I went to see it at a cinema in Piccadilly Circus in London, and I couldn't believe what I saw. I felt physically sick for three days afterwards. I just felt nauseous of what I'd seen. Um, and I remember then a few days later going out with a friend of mine and we ended up in like an arcade, you know, and there was a shoot 'em up game and I couldn't play it. I was just like, I don't want to do this. I don't want anything to do with this. It just feels so weird. Yeah. Um, so the fact that it was the same crew, the same car, um, cast of, people directing it and and writing it and all that business producing it that held a lot of power over us or me anyway i was like okay this is going to be like that and then as soon as you started seeing the rushes seeing you're like okay and then of course the the quality of the actors you're working with as well you're like well if he's in it (laughs) this is gonna be good because does i was when you were saying that i was i was thinking about something and and i don't know if this is a thing for you. So I'm maybe way off base here, but I always wonder, and because I don't know them and you know them, the best actors, the ones mm-hmm. that are able to p- portray the, the real people, the parts that you guys did in Man of Brothers, the parts like Saving, in Saving Private Ryan, all of those parts, those, those parts that most people living it once is enough, let alone ever having to pretend to have gone through it do you do you find those people to be more empathetic individuals in general? Yes, uh, yes. Um, some not always. Um, that's weird. It's a weird. Some people are blessed with a weird, freaky ability to do it and be not sort of empathetic in a weird way. Uh, I'll give you an example. The guy that plays Blythe, Mark Warren, who's a spectacular actor, I, it, he's a very enigmatic dude. I wouldn't say he wasn't empathetic, but he's very, he's just his own guy. He's just, there's mm-hmm. nobody like him. He's wild. I mean, he's, he's sober and everything now, but he was crazy back then. <laughs> he just, he just into everything. Um, but he has the ability to just let go of everything and be, and just let everything out. Um, but oh. then there are other actors, people like James Maddio, who plays Conte and, and Frank John Hughes and stuff, who are very empathetic. Very, they just, it's that sort of encouragement that I was talking about earlier. They just kind of want to understand what you're doing and be part of it. And, and they are really, um, yeah, are very, very empathetic and, and understand and, and, and have the ability to kind of absorb it and think, right, 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 that's the way I need to be. It, there were no egos on Band of Brothers at all, really, which is very strange. Um, and that, I think, that was the weeded out in casting, as far as I can tell from listening to Meg Lieberman. Um, but it, 
people with big egos aren't very empathetic. They, they're just all about themselves. So it was very right. much the best actors, the best, the ones that you think that guy's spectacular, are always super nice people in their own way. They might, they might be a little bit like odd because they have all this, you know, fame and attention. It's very difficult to deal with stuff like that. So I can always forgive anybody's behavior like that, but, the, but they're always really good people deep down. Uh, mm -hmm. and maybe it's because like you say, they're empathetic. Any actor that you hear who's a complete tool, uh, they generally aren't very good. Like the best actors are always really nice people. Um, well, because you, you never know. Yeah, you actors that you might. Yeah, often actors that, that sort of sell themselves as being super nice as well are complete tools. Um, uh, and, and, and so people that, that have made it that, that you think, are you any good? I don't think you are. They're usually massive tools. Um, but people, people that you think you'd think, man, I bet that guy's a douche. They're not. Do you know what I mean? They're just, they're just really, really good. Yeah. Well, I always wonder that because when, when you said, you know, I watched Saving Private Ryan and I felt ill for three days. I mean, yeah. to, for somebody to have, for something to have an effect like that on you, it that means that you would have to be a very empathetic individual. It just, it, you would have to, because there's no reason. There's plenty of people who watch tons of horrific violence. For example, my response to say Fury versus somebody else I know who's never been in war's response to Fury, very different thing. Right. It's a very different thing. Right. The way that I feel it, the way that, I, you know, when Brad Pitt's doing this and someone's over here and there's the comment of, you know, take her into that room where I will situation. Like you, I'm able to see, go back and like see what that was during that time and what happened during like what happens during war and the the graphic nature of it all and when he starts speaking about the horses and all these things it's like it throws me off kilter completely mm. and it's not because i think i'm just empathetic but i think it's because i've had personal experience in combat but empathy is something that is hard to fake you right if you're not empathetic, you're not empathetic. If you're if you're just a very analytical person and that's how your brain works, that's fine too. You can still have empathy, but there's there's a difference between people who are like, I feel everything always, and people who can just keep a cold stone face. And it is the actors I feel like that are the best, that are the best actors. I I don't know them in person, but you know some of them. So I'm thinking specifically Tom Hanks in general. Mm -hmm. he's empathetic he he's he's empathetic on camera and it translates unlike so many other people i don't know what he's like in person but again like oh, you said it's massive it's, tool you know, <laughs> just absolute horrible human being just just the worst just the worst if satan and hitler had a love child it would be it was him it was it was him incarnate he he, he is exactly how you imagine him to be exactly how you imagine him. he has time for everybody and he just yeah. gets bugged all day long you know can you sign this can you have a picture all he has time for everybody but a depth his empathy is kind of this i don't know he's not just oversensitive he's got a kind of driving he's, there's something in him that drives him forward like i want to make the story i want to make this work and so he's he's quite a Quite a strong-willed character as well. Um, it reminds me, and that's Neil too. Yeah, very yeah, similar, 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 similar stoicism as Neil. Similar drive and a similar. I mean, Neil just has this kind of like almost like a. He's almost like a. I don't know how I'm describing like a like a a preacher or something. Do you know what I mean? He's got a kind of like. He's got an air about, about him. him. Yeah, like he said, you know, you know. Bless you, son. You'd think I'm blessed. I'm blessed, Neil. Blessed. I'm blessed. Yeah. But um, because he just that goodness comes out of him. That's my point. I think that's what I'm trying Light. to say. Light, Light comes and out goodness of him. comes out of him. And and yeah, times is the same way. Yeah. Um, and uh, but just his ability is is freakish. I I I was doing a scene once that he was directing, and he um, the other actor was on a different set. So he was just like, "Oh, I'll read it for you." So, oh, just, that's not intimidating at all. No, exactly. No, but it was like a kid. 
it was like a 17 year old kid or someone that's just been know, press ganged in some replacement <laughs> and he just picked up he picked up the script <laughs> and he just <laughs> transformed himself into a 17 year old kid and said this line and he just became like a really young looking said line looked at me and i remember just going like like, what? like a fish <laughs> i was just looking at him like <laughs> i was like you gonna answer me i was like in a second, once I realized what's happening. In a happening. second, when I, how did you do that? They just poke at you for weird. Yeah. Um, but great, and just, just, just without any ego, I mean, there was a time we were filming late at night or early in the morning. I don't know. I think it was the scenes before we went to Bastogne in all the trucks in the dark. And he decided he'd take a pee against the side of a lorry. So he's gone behind the lorry to have a pee, and somebody had a point and shoot snap Kodak camera with a flash on it. Jumped around and went, ksh, ksh, and took a picture where he just burst out laughing. And it must have taken him an hour to process what might happen because of who he is. And he went oh, up to me and was no. like, Oh, careful where you get that process, by the way. But oh, he, didn't, no. like, he didn't think, um, you know. The world's going to see Tom Hanks' penis. What are you doing? You can't see Tom Hanks' penis. It's like it's, it's just my it'll penis. destroy the myth. He's like a Ken yeah. doll. He doesn't have a penis. That's right. He is. I mean, <laughs> after like an he icon. Did, exactly. After he did Mr. Um, Mr. Uh, was it? Oh, my God. Robert? No. What is wrong with me right now? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking uh, about? Mr. I just Rogers. watched it. Mr. Rogers. I'm like, what is wrong with me? I had a, I was just, when you started talking about him, turning into a character at 17, all I could see was Mr. Rogers playing in the back of my head in the part where he plays the voices of the little kids. And I remember watching that and just, what is yeah. that? Yeah. You don't go from playing in something like Band of Brothers and screaming like horrific, like you don't, and then going to play that, the depths of him is fantastic. But Enough about Tom. He gets enough attention. He doesn't yeah, need he it. Does. He does. He loves it too. Loves it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> loves it. Yeah. Super, super supportive of it. Loves being attacked. What is that like working on a set where the real World War II easy company guys came? Because I know some of you got to actually have conversations and sit with and learn from. Very odd. Very odd. Um, it isn't. It's not comparable to anything else you could do as an actor. It's not like I don't know. Let's say you play I don't know a disgraced politician, and the disgraced politician comes down on set. And you're like, you know, <laughs> you're a pervert. Uh, <laughs> it's 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 very strange. It has two effects. The first being like, holy shit, we can't mess this up. And the second one, it makes you feel a little bit ridiculous for thinking you were doing it for real. <laughs> you just like, okay, we're just playing this, aren't we? Um, but we were doing a scene in the back of a deuce and a half one night, and there was a whisper coming down that Dick Winters was on set. Uh, and he'd come over from the States. And at one point, I think he was with Ivan Schwartz, we came up and we were we were we we were just setting up to film in the back of this deuce and a half. So Tom Hanks is behind the camera with his son Chester. He was his son with him, um, uh, and we're all sat there. And suddenly the the canvas at the back of the truck goes up like that, and this little dude. I mean, I'm little, and he's like this big. <laughs> little dude stood there, and it's Dick Winters, and he looks into the truck, looks at everybody in there, goes sheet white. So some of the Ivan Schwartz gets taken off set back to the airport, goes home. He said uh, he looks like looking into a bunch of ghosts. So that's, oh. I mean, that's the age of 25, which is one of walls, that's beyond your comprehension, really. You can't really compute that, why that's happened. How old was he when he came over when you guys were filming? Golly, I wish I could give you a straight answer here. I'm guessing late 70s. With it enough. Uh, ooh, yeah, probably late 70s, I would have thought. Oh, Off my the top goodness. Of my head. There, there, were some guys, there were some guys like, you know, Bill Garnier and Babe Heffron who loved being around the guys. Do you know what I mean? Loved it. Mm -hmm. um, Do you think it took them back? 
they felt. Yeah, I think they, I think it did. I think they just loved being around the guys. They loved all the fuss. They loved the drinking with them, and they, I think they just loved it. They just loved mucking in and having fun. They were those, those, those type of guys, you know. Yeah, but what a beautiful thing that you guys were able to give them, giving them the, the, the situation, the feel, the the visual of being back there with the people they loved but mm-hmm. alive, but instead they get to be not shot at and not blown up. Right, right, right. Yeah, I like, think, uh, was it, is it Richard Spate Jr. tell the story? I forget. They came down and they wanted to see the guy that plays Muck, which is him. I think it's either him or Tim Matthews, one of the two. So they came down and they said, Who, where's Muck? Which one of you is Muck? And so Richard Spate Jr. is like, it's me. Uh, and he came over and they were like, I buried you. I watched you. You know, I, I, I buried you in in Bastogne. I buried you. I buried you in Foy. It was very. That was very strange. He oh. had a shell hit directly into their foxhole and been blown to smithereens. That was strange. But then I then toured. I did a battlefield tour with Brad Freeman, who's now the last remaining veteran of Easy Company, and he was talking about it as well about that direct hit on the foxhole and how there was just nothing there. Do you know what I mean? He was just, yeah. he, he sort of was trying to find something, anything. And it had just been like evaporated. That's so what artillery as much as they wanted, stuff yeah, does. As, yeah, as much as they wanted to, uh, to to joke around a drink and tell us how rubbish we were, there, there were some definite, definite touchstones for them. But that's a that's a special thing. I mean, to be able to be a part of that and to witness that, and there that's the generation I'm having the hardest time watching go. I mm. don't I don't know. It maybe it's just me because I'm I don't I I I consider myself an optimistic person, but I also do really struggle with the current state of the world, and I do struggle with the way in which it's being handled, and when. You see individuals that are from World War II and Korea and Vietnam and people who fought over land, who fought in Europe, but through the streets, through homes, through alleyways where you go to shop now. And the weight behind that it's so different to lose those people than it is. It's, it's hard to explain because Afghanistan and Iraq for so many people seem so far away. They can never imagine that happening here. They can never imagine that happening in Europe again or in Germany again. We can't picture that ever happening and yet it's happening again. And mm. it's happening again right at the tail end of all of these people who liberated camps who saw what hate can do what Mm. real real hate will do and the depths in which people will go to make sure it's executed properly these are the people these are the men these are the people that opened the doors to let individuals free and we're losing them and we're it seems like the faster we lose them the further we fall back into that behavior because no one's here to say it's wrong to say how wrong it really is and what it leads to we're losing we're losing that and that's why when you said you know tell me more about how it was a disappointment no because the films things like band of brothers as we lose these people they're all we have left Hmm. to get these young kids to wrap their brains around the weight of it and I think that's why it does. There is a definite ground smell of ground swell, ground smell, ground swell of young people that that do get into the show at a certain age because of that reason. I think um, in the it was the last uncomplicated war in a way, the last sort of good versus evil in a in a profound way. I mean. I mean, just ideologically, just profound. Um, and it it it, it took <laughs> it took kids from farms who've never left the state to come 
here to England to train to jump to jump out of a plane. <laughs> Probably never been in a plane near one. Jump out of a plane into the dark and liberate the country that they had no idea about. I mean, they could have just not gone. I mean, it's that there's no reason, you know. So yes, it is. It, 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 it's it is beyond comprehension at the moment for people. Uh, it is, and that's what makes me concerned. That, that that's what it took, yeah. The, and I think there's a sort of there's a thinking amongst people right now. Yeah, be right. Someone else take care of it. And it's like, no, no, you have to take care of it. And when it, these were the guys, were like, I had to just do it. I had to do my job. Um, and in doing so, I lost half my friends in the horrendous conditions. And the way that it was done, especially in the United States, and conscription you were going whether you wanted to go or not you were going right. because you needed to go the idea of again my son only being five but the idea of in 10 years or less they could have if if he was born then they could have pulled him at the age of there was 14 15 16 17 year old kids over there liberating countries and the most our 14 15 16 year old kids of this generation can do is a TikTok dance. So, you know, I, I'm concerned at the, the, the direction, frankly. And I think it's, it takes people sitting down and explaining to their kids like this, you know, you don't understand because maybe there isn't any left to realize. I feel like when people die, mm -hmm. there is no, it, the touch tone, like the, the peace, the, the, the remaining physical evidence, the the thing that can talk to you and walk and, and that's there, you can't deny that. But when that's gone and it's just film and it's just sound clips and it's just cameras, it's a different thing. And I, I would hate to see us going down that path, but whether you want to say I'm negative or not, I, I believe it is. That's from a mental health perspective, even if you're looking at the state of the world, just from mental health, mm -hmm. strictly mental health that's wiping out more human beings than than war is by a long shot right now the suicide oh epidemic is is skyrocketing at least in canada and the united states it's 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 a it's a it's a pandemic of its own it's it's an mm -hmm. epidemic it's a it's taking not even i'm not even just saying vets i'm 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 talking regular civilian individuals what this this the disease whatever you want to call it the the bioweapon uh, you know i talk to certain people in my community and they go no this was like really well planned this was a beautiful strategic move this was and then i talk to normal civilians and they're like it's just like you know it's just it's a pandemic it's the flu and i'm like that's not just how things work in the world but <laughs> there's not and when you when you know that there were camps where there were people being murdered just for their beliefs and then you, you know that they're still actively happening in other countries um, and we're not doing anything about it because, frankly, I even if we got the chance to do anything about it, I don't know that our youth would even try. Like I don't know that if you said to your friend who was 16, hey, I'm going to liberate those concentration camps in China, over 12,000 of them mm -hmm. active in 2021, I'm going to go help liberate that. There's no chance in hell you're going to get a kid from this generation to be like, I'll drop everything. I've never been there. I don't know the culture. I'm going to go give my life for that. Right. No chance. Right. Yeah. That scares me. I guess was that maybe not the mindset in America in the 30s and 40s up until Pearl Harbor, though? I mean, it might have been. Um, I, I can't. I can I mean, see. I mean, it was... I'm interested by the very question. I, I've asked the question to Graham Yost and John Orloff, the writers, the self same question of: Will we ever see a generation like that again? Does that mindset, uh, since the the sort of '60s, where people were just told, "Hey, it's all about you. Don't worry about anything else. It's all about you," and then that's how we monetize that. Um, whether you could ever have a sort of 
generation of people who were just like, right, I'm going to go, I'm going to go and, and do my duty over there. Um, and I get different answers, but you, I, I do, I, I wonder, I get different answers whether whether you could, but I think you would need to feel a direct visceral threat. Yeah, you'd that makes more need sense. To see, you'd need to see people wandering down your street in a German army uniform or whatever, or you'd need to, I don't know how, but uh, this is interesting. I wonder, I wonder myself. Um, well, you have kids, so, I mean, they're growing up in this world. Yes. Yeah. Um I don't know. I, I, I'm, a, I, I'm around my. They're, they're good people. Like the, the my kid and, and his friends are good people. Whether or not they would be, they're very different to where, how we were or how mm -hmm. I was. Um, it, it seems to maybe have skipped a generation. They seem more empathetic. My son and his friends and stuff seem seem like they're better, more open people than I was. <laughs> Yeah, I mean those boarding schools don't really foster emotional intelligence much. I feel like. Yeah, that might have been it. Maybe it's just that he goes to a decent school, but I'd be interested. There's, I mean, he's friend, he's got friends that are reenactors and stuff. They're all into World War Two as well. Why? So I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His best friend is a reenactor. Uh, he's Canadian as well. Does Canadian stuff. There's like Commonwealth soldiers and all that kind of stuff. It's it's interesting. That's different, but I mean, maybe that maybe that's why your people your humans will be different, right? Is because they have that, that touch piece to it because of you, because you, Maybe. you, you foster that though. You, you know, you talk about the importance of, I'm assuming you talk about the importance of, you know, humanity and, and being a good person and responsibility. So it, I feel like because the band of brothers had such a huge impact on you and your life and kind of just the way that it seems like you speak about acting and, the way that you speak about the craft was Band of Brothers as much of a catalyst point in terms of your career as it seems, or is was that did that come? Did you have other things afterwards that you found were bigger or more important to you? Uh, that's a good question. Elizabeth Taylor famously said, "When you get what you want, it's not the beginning, but the beginning, the end." And weirdly enough, it was almost my falling out of love with acting was the end of Band of Brothers. I just, whether that's not just as good as it's going to get, or I don't know whether I just was driven as a person to want to do something really big like that. And then when it was over, there was a part of me that was mildly heartbroken. And then I just, a part of me just lost something to do with acting after that. I carried on for a good few years, did a whole bunch of stuff, but I'm not sure my heart was in it as much. Was it too real? Uh, it was just too perfect, I think, in on of itself, in that it was just so well written, casted, acted, you know, shot, portrayed. It just, it's like, I don't know, <clears throat> it's in my nature to to want to move on and do different things. And once I'd done that and it was completed, and then you're just doing lower versions of things. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. it, you, I just, I don't know whether I just, so I just lost the, the will to keep going as intensely as I had done as a younger person up to that point. Um, right. And so I don't know. I just didn't, it, 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 it was a weird, weird situation for me. I just was a bit like, mm, I'm not sure I particularly want to do this anymore. Well, hey, I mean, it's, it's doing, doing what you did right from the start, working on, on that project right from the start. I can imagine there was a lot of weight that went into that. I, I you know, I, I often think about, movies and shows that are based on war and when you watch them you can tell if they're done well you can tell if they're done right you can tell if they're done well and the people who who cut on the budget and and, and don't provide proper uniforms or make people go to boot camp and learn how to do all of the things that you have to do to be accurate about it they never last they never do well 
Right. But there was something like you said about Band of Brothers, though, that even if you were 50, you know, people deep from the camera, you had to nail it. And yep. it took a special type of magic to do that. You guys had a massive budget on that too, didn't you? For the time, yes. About 120 million, yeah. About 20 million an episode. That's insane. I think Pacific was 200 million. Um, but then as Graham Yost points out, that's one Harry Potter movie. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so yeah. That just blows my mind when you're talking about budgets, when we talk about film budgets. And I, I, it's astronomical, a very brief conversations I've had with some people about them and my brain kind of goes, how much yeah. is that going to take to make? And they're like that. And I'm like, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The numbers, the numbers are, in, are incredible. Um, so a lot of what you, you do, so I'm going to flip the, flip the tables on you a little bit. So uh, a lot of your, um, what got you into this? Well, we were speaking about it before the, the mental health stuff. And yeah. that sprang from your time as an active soldier. Correct. I have a question, and it, uh, it's not in any way mean to be incendiary. I'm just interested by the answer. Go ahead. If you could go back and not serve and not have the mental health problems, would you do it? No. No. no, you wouldn't do it, or no, you wouldn't. Yes, I wouldn't did. go. Yeah. I wouldn't go back and change a thing. I would change nothing. I would change nothing. I've been asked that question before. I would change nothing. People say, "Well, that's easy to say because you can't go back." So you know, you live, you you move forward, and you live with it, right? And and <laughs> sure, sure, there's a aspect of that, but I'm a really big believer of things happen the way they're supposed to happen, whether you like the result or not. Mm -hmm. And there's always a, and I'm not a religious person. I was born and raised Catholic. I had it shoved down my throat. I was baptized. I went to Catholic school. I and did religion class. And then the second I got the opportunity to bounce, I bounced. So right. because I, you know, and then, and then I found psychedelics and I learned very quickly that it's not religion that I was pushed to pushing against. It was, um, this idea of not understanding and this idea that I'm supposed to say that there's this one person I'm supposed to, you know, give all my energy to. And when I went on tour and I joined the military, it was a very quick decision. It was, I was 18. I just moved away for the first time. I was 17 when I left high school and I uh, went and I made a snap decision and I joined. and. I was fully well told that we were deployable and we would be deploying in a very short period of time. And I was 18. I couldn't wrap my brain around what that meant because the idea of Afghanistan, really all, all I could think of was what I would see on the news. So towers being blown up. I remember when that happened, like many people do. And then I would start seeing soldiers come home because I graduated high school in, in 2007 I went joined the military in 2007. Um, I deployed in 2009 and I was out by 2011. So I knew there was a chance of a quick turnaround. And but when you say you're going to fight on behalf of, you know, freeing women and children and so that you don't get attacked here, the, the media did a beautiful job of making me be fearful of the idea that they could come here and do it here. And that goes back to what you were saying. like. They felt a direct threat. I felt a direct threat, and I don't right. like feeling helpless about things. So, I don't. Um, I don't regret. Like, if somebody's like, if you, because the the operation I I got end up causing the end of my career. They, I was voluntold for it. Um, I was told you're going, and that's the end of the conversation. And I didn't know what that meant, and I. Missed uh, the first the first Chinook. We missed the first Chinook. I had to turn around. It couldn't come get me. And so all it really would have taken is me to be like, miss one more flight, and that none of this would have happened. I probably still would have been in. I would have been a very different person. But I'm glad I pushed to go on that operation. I'm glad I where it was where I was. I'm glad I was in the situations I was in, and they're horrific, and they 
when I sit down and think about them, they break me a little every single time. But it's been since 2009. And I've been in treatment for every week since then. And sorted out how to work through all of that. So now I have, if you would have asked me this five years ago, I would have given you a very different answer. I probably would have said, no, I wish I never did it. But as I've gotten older and I've understood it and understood what happened to my brain and why it happened and that it's okay to have trauma, it's how you handle it and how you work on it. And it really is work if you want to get better, but you can get better and you can push through it. So I think I, I came up pretty unscathed. I have all my limbs. I don't have any shrapnel in my body. And I say I only lost a handful of friends, but I only lost a handful of friends. I've lost more now to suicide than I did on deployment. But the point is, I was meant to go down this path for another reason. I'm not sure what it is, but I think it's starting to unfold into what I'm doing now. So if I'm able to help people on a grander scale, then it was all worth the bullshit. It was worth it. I think so. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy one, right? <laughs> it's not an easy thing. Everybody, most people at least, they, have, they say they have something they regret. I, I've done a lot of soul searching. I don't know that I have anything that I've done that I regret. I'm stuff I'm not proud of. But I don't think I've ever done anything I like would want to change or regret. I'm mm -hmm. sitting here with you. <laughs> I wouldn't and of have course, got here. Sponsored, sponsored by Deflity. <laughs> exactly. But that's what I'm saying. I wouldn't have, if I didn't deploy, I didn't get hurt, I wouldn't have had a chance to write a book. I wouldn't have been living out where I am. I wouldn't have done a charity event. Neil wouldn't have come to my charity event. I wouldn't have become friends with Neil. I wouldn't have signed to do projects with Neil. I wouldn't have done Band of Brothers and I wouldn't be sitting here with you. Right. There's so many things that needed to happen for my life to unfold the way I've always wanted it to. And unfortunately, combat happened to be one of those shitty things that had to, that was my like kickoff point, if you will. <laughs> mm -hmm. right. So bad. It's so bad. But, but no, combat is, combat is different and is weird, but it is not a regret of mine. Right. Okay. Do you regret going into acting? No. No, even though it did drive me completely bonkers. Um, but no, no, I don't. I don't, I'm like you, I don't really regret anything. I've done bad or good. Uh, it does make you who you are. Uh, but I don't have something that I have to deal with all day, every day that I could probably do without, which is why I was asking the question. I would love to do without the angry voice in my head, <laughs> but right. you know, there's um, psychedelics really have been the key to me really pushing past that kind of plateau point where, you know, meditation wasn't enough and talk therapy wasn't enough and, you know, positive mindset and journaling it when, when all those weren't enough, I was fortunate enough to find psychedelics through an army ranger um his name's um matthew griffin he's uh he owns a company called combat flip-flops this is sweater actually nice. yes be a better human because you know psychedelics heal and he knew about them and um, gave me an opportunity i had him on the show and he spoke with me after the show and was like how you doing and i was like great and he's like liar <laughs> liar <Yeah. laughs> and um he broke me down like pretty damn quick and introduced me, gave me an opportunity to go with Heroic Hearts, which is a charity. They have a UK version, actually. It's called Heroic Hearts UK. And then they have one in the US and then they've got a Canadian one starting. But what they are is it's funded by, it's a ranger, another army special forces guy. Um, and he started it. Uh, it's ayahuasca and psilocybin and, you know, I began in those types of treatments. But I did ayahuasca for the first time in this year, in January of this year. And even up until January of this year, I still had suicidal bouts really bad. And I have a husband and a kid and a company and a podcast and I got stuff and I'm doing this and doing that. And yet that wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. Nothing was enough. So then 
when I got the opportunity to go with heroic hearts and sit and do ayahuasca in a shamanistic setting, it, I haven't had a suicidal ideation since I haven't, um, been on any pharmaceutical medication since I'm thriving. I'm super active again. I'm working on different projects across the board. Psychedelics were really kind of the, the last, um, the missing, the missing block to like going, this is how we're going to deal with that voice every day. It was like, everything was always kind of, what is that? What is that game called? Where you pull the blocks out and it's a tower Jenga. There it is. I'll get there. Yeah. I also have a lot of concussions and brain <laughs> stuff. So give me a moment. Um, but Jenga, so it's always kind of like that teetering piece that just was like, wow, well, oh, oh, eh, oh, eh, oh, eh, we're going to go. Psychedelics was that block I put back underneath to give me that solid foundation again in the tools to handle the bullshit that's in my head. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's like the seventies again over here, man. <laughs> I was going to say, to get in on that uh <laughs> hey. hey i got plans don't worry but no it's that it's, uh, ayahuasca has been a massive massive help um psilocybin on a microdose basis for depression has been key there's such great research being done at harvard and john hopkins and and, and um where else are they doing a uh, stanford they're doing some fantastic research on psilocybin and ibogaine for addiction and um, five, five MEO DMT as well for veterans, for trauma, psychedelics have been a breakthrough. Really? Yeah. MDMA, like seriously, K treatment, all of it. Wow. I'm not like even just saying this to like, get you to agree with me on camera. Like I'm legitimate. So there's a Heroic Hearts is a great foundation. There's another one called Vet Solutions. It's run by um, it's run by Marcus and Amber Capone. Marcus Capone was a SEAL Team Six member, and um, really struggled with a lot of things after service. And did I believe it was ibogaine for the first time, and everything changed. And then they started this whole foundation around it, and they're doing all this research with the university. So it's it's coming in hot in our industry because it's saving people's lives like you've never seen. Well, wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. I didn't know anything about that, no. Really? Yeah. I'm going to send you all the links. Yeah, send me the links. Oh, yeah. you're going to love uh, it. Yeah, I, psychedelics I, are, are good for really going in and then getting your shit kicked by ayahuasca. It's a good time. Is it? That's fascinating. Yeah. I consider myself a bit of a connoisseur of drugs myself. but uh, Do you I'm, now? Yes. <laughs> Not the good recreational. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know um a buddy of mine that lives over and I think he's in Wales. Um Jez, he was a uh, British military and he's got a podcast called The um it was a veteran state of mind and uh he's also a writer, a really good writer at that. But he the over covid I had him on the show and the one thing he said was like I can't go anywhere to get anything from anyone. <laughs> He I know what devastated. that means straight away. <laughs> yeah, he was devastated. He's like, I went to, he's like, I went to one, it was like one like rave or some shit. It's like one time this whole time. And it was like the best feeling I've ever had in ever because everybody was just so happy to be out. Everyone was so happy to have everything they wanted. Right. But the thing that we talked about that was wild was um, for him to go by like, for you guys to go buy or anyone to go buy like a 26 or of, of vodka or whiskey and get drunk and get alcohol poisoning and choke and to death, that's mm -hmm. totally fine. But if say Jez wanted to go down the street to get psilocybin to microdose for his depression, he'll go to prison. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just all mind boggling to me. Yeah. Um, on a, a slight tangent there, do you know um, the MDMA or E? as we call it here, Molly, or whatever you call it, um, was the reason that football hooliganism stopped in this country. I'm sorry? Well, back in the late 70s and 80s, you, you couldn't go to a soccer match without getting your head kicked in. There were these big oh. firms of football fans who just used to beat the living crap out of one another, and then they would go over to Europe and beat the crap out of everybody over there. And that's that's where um, the casual fashion came in. in, in 
mm. in, in England, you know, Lacoste and that stuff. They'd go over there and they'd rob all these um, shops in France and stuff and wear all this posh gear to the football so that the police didn't know them, they'd see them coming. They weren't wearing scarves anymore. Anyway, there's these whole firms kicking the living crap out of one another. It was a whole scourge. Nobody knew what to do about it. And suddenly ecstasy came on the market and you would get like nightclubs where you'd have Everton fans on one side, Liverpool fans on the other, waiting to beat the crap out of one another. And then they would all take ecstasy. And then within five minutes, everyone would be hugging. And it just <laughs> ended football hooliganism in this country. Really? Yeah. As a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a thing that people went out and did to vent on society or to just feel that buzz uh, of being of, uh, of being in sort of hand-to-hand combat as it were ended oh with, with ecstasy i had no idea ecstasy. yeah <laughs> and then they banned ecstasy and all you can get now is death the team <laughs> 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 It's so good. Like the placement <laughs> and the timing is so, it's so perfect. It keeps catching my eye. That's why. I, well, how know. can you not? It's like, definitely, if I had something, sh- I had the book right, I didn't see anything. But I wish I would have had, next time I have you on, I'm going to have something obnoxious and I'm going to do random ads for it <laughs> throughout the day or whenever <laughs> you drag me on yours. I'm going to come on. And I'm just going to start doing any, I want you to know that anytime now. You invite me to do anything, whether it's in person, on film, on podcast, anything. There will, there will be an ad of my choosing that you'll not know about until the time of. I, I look forward to it. I look okay, forward good. to bated breath. Yes, some yeah. very, very peculiar. Yes. Watch, watch the breath. Big. You'll get too much wind. We don't. I will. Yeah, <laughs> watch, watch the in breath on that. Didn't swallow the air, did you? Because if you did, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> too perfect. Oh my god, that's too perfect. So, what are you up to now? What do you got going on now? Uh, I am preparing for a big old We Happy Few event this Saturday, where we've got just bloody everybody on. We've got a whole bunch of the cast. We've got some of the Pacific guys on. We've got some platoon guys on. Uh, but it's. It's light-hearted. We're just gonna we're gonna roast Captain Die. We're gonna talk a bit of boot camp. We've got Freddie Joe's coming on, uh, and but it's just fun. I've, I've got a whole bunch of questions, but they're not particularly based around the shows. They're based around what was your most diva moment? You know, have you ever dated anyone that became super famous? And you think, damn, um, there's so many people that are gonna have yeses to that. And I'm gonna watch. I it. know. I, I have. I have. A, I have a stunner. Um, Oh, okay. They're just basically based on my life. That's why I used to think, damn. There used to be a girl at college um, when I went to drama school. Little, uh, I think she was Indian. She's a beautiful girl. She used to wear like green um, contact lenses. Stunning girl. But I just, she was just little and young. And I was like, okay, leave me alone. But she used to follow me around like, hello. <laughs> um, and it turns out that her father was the preeminent diamond merchant in the world and she lived at the top of trump towers and i was just like damn <laughs> what were you thinking <laughs> i don't know i don't know oh the internet we didn't have social media to check I don't the think background. You can do a background check yes that takes a lot of boxes that takes all the boxes i'll just fine let's go yeah let's go let's go let's go and have my own butler that would be lovely yes. i know but now but then you wouldn't be if you had your own butler, you wouldn't have time to go to cricket matches with your friends and just get drunk. You wouldn't. I feel like that's all I would do, but I I, I appreciate your support. Okay. I all feel right. like I would I would be there in Australia right now. What, do you want to be in Australia right now? Uh, well, no, probably not. Actually, yeah, I, I saved. Not. Yeah, you, you're welcome. You, you saved me right there. You I, did. I just you saved you. Me. You saved me, yeah. saved me from months of quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> months of quarantine, $5,000 fines, and their own military turns on their own people. It's no big deal. It's perfectly fine. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah it's a cute exactly. time. So how does anybody who's been listening kind of find you and what you do and participate and, and become aware of you? 
uh, you just tap We Happy Few 506 into the internet and then tap on the site. Uh, and it's all there. It's all there. What we do, we do all these like, um, we do all these kind of band of brother reunion episode by episode and chat to all the actors. And it's good stuff. It's not because um, I host it. It's, it, it's, yeah, I know the questions to ask the guys and it's not kind of like stock responses and I try and trip people up. And I do say that the real ticket though is when we stop recording, but I can't help that because everyone comes on and then when we stop recording and everybody stays on, that's when the real stories roll out. And I wish I could get that, but I can't. I wish I could just carry on recording fakely. I'm just going to carry on. And then real quietly. Out. Real quietly. Uh, we do also do some of the Pacific stuff, Pacific cast reunions. And like I say, we've got some platoon guys coming on now as well. So, yeah, we're just that's out there doing fantastic. that. Yeah. Well, we're just doing it. So if you want to, if you're interested, come come and hit hit us up. All the old episodes now are on a kind of like library on Vimeo, so you can you can rent them at any time. Yeah, and they're all. I know they're there. I've watched them recently again. I remember I saw them and I was like, oh, it's about that time. <laughs> it's about that time I need to get I need to have my refresher. And it's about that time. Such guys, such such a value add to society. It really is from the arts perspective. From from just humanity and really documenting something that was so important, so necessary and doing it in a way that not only I got to be on the reunion. So witness the families and just say how much of an honor it is to see how well it's done and how well it's respected and how much you guys all care so deeply about those characters, which were their family members. It's, um, it's so great to, to get just a little bit of that and get to know you and get to know some of the guys from it because it, it had influence on me. It has influence on others. And I'm, I'm glad that it is out there in the world for people to see. So thank you for inadvertently making a really awesome series that is going to stand the test of time and really help our world realize that shit did happen. There were people that went through a lot of things and we can't forget those stories and those memories. So I'm super, super excited that you could come on with us today. Oh, thank you. And yeah, and as a as a sign that the doesn't matter who we have on the show, you know, Donnie Wattberg or whoever, the only the thing that people really interact with is the veterans' families coming on. That's what, what the chat afterwards is always, you know, oh, it was amazing to see, you know, their niece or nephew or son. Mm -hmm. or, you know, that, that that's what people are really blown away by. The most sort of uh, 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 stunning moment was we had Lieutenant Welsh, who's played by Eric Warden, had his granddaughter on. So she came on. And she was she was on a stud farm or something odd. She was around <laughs> horses, and it, it was it was an amiable chat and all the rest of it. And then just as she was going, she went, "Oh, by the way, I just want to say, Rick, every time I look at you and you're laughing, you have my grandfather's smile." And then you oh. <laughs> just watch a tear go <laughs> straight down Rick Warden's face, like oh, and just cracked him. Was, it was silent for a while, and I was like. Do, do I say something? I'm kind of sniveling over here. I'll say something facetious. That'll break the. That'll break the ice. <laughs> well, that's what happens, though, right? You guys did such a beautiful job. Like just watching Neil interact with Buck's family and all of that. Yeah. And hey, Neil. Hey, what's going? Like, just yeah. their family. It's special. It's really unique, and I'm really glad that I got to be very teeny itty bitty part of getting to just know you guys and um understand the process and understand why you you guys did everything that you did on that show it's it's just so fucking well done it's insane yeah, there, yeah. there's nothing been that good there just yeah. nothing can compare i know and that's and also that's why it's been really easy for me to put these series of shows together because i literally email you know whoever neil and neil's a superstar you know that and i think mm -hmm. myself, i'm gonna ask him to come on like send and i'll i'll fling it in an auto response it just goes boom fuck off but it's just like <laughs> yeah i'll be there when you need me and i'm like, really he's, he's coming on neil's coming on he <laughs> never curses i do enough cursing in one sentence for him and yeah is. i don't think he does curse actually yes no 
no, I he's pretty, he he's pretty good about it. That's for sure. I can tell. Trust me. Yeah, he's good about yeah. it. Yes. Yes. I'm trying but to think what Neil would say in response rather than fuck off. Um, Golly, honestly, no. <laughs> yeah, it would be, it would be something. <laughs> By the beard of Zeus, no. It would be something along those lines, yes. From <laughs> from one of those uh, one of those scenes, it would definitely he would have a smart comeback for sure. But it wouldn't be a curse word, I can tell you that. <laughs> but um, I really appreciate you taking the time. I know in all of your hungoverness. Thank you. Yes, yes. Hey, no, yes. I, I, just just sleepy, not hungover. <laughs> okay, just sleeping. He was just he was just sleeping. Was just sleeping hours, he was just sleeping on the floor. Yeah. Normal behavior. <laughs> Nothing weird about it at all. No, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, well, st you stick with me and everyone else. I guess we will see you all next week.